I was watching the news the day after Attorney General Jeff Sessions announced the administration was going to phase out Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. In case you aren't familiar, DACA is a program that allows undocumented people who were brought here before 2007, who were at that time under the age of 16, to study and work in the U.S. legally for renewable two-year periods, provided they don't commit serious crime. Now, I don't assume we all see things the same way in this congregation. But I am charged to tell the truth as I see it. And friends, as I see it, this act by the president was callous and reprehensible. If Congress chooses not to act and DACA is dismantled, teachers and factory workers and engineers and so many others could be deported to countries some of them have never visited. Keep an eye on our communication channels at BUU as we work with our local partners in the community. And I hope you can join us at 6.30 tonight at Dayspring United Methodist Church in Tempe where we'll sing and pray and hear the stories of some local dreamers affected by the President's decision. But back to Wednesday, the day after the President's announcement. I was watching the news. Being interviewed was Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, vocal critic of the DACA program since its beginning under President Obama. From where I was sitting, it looked like the interviewer kind of had Kobach on the ropes. Just as little beads of sweat appeared on his forehead, she played a video of a dreamer who was brought here at the age of two. He's a college student now, about to graduate and begin his career, and he said he feels his country is telling him he isn't wanted. The reporter asked Chris Kobach, what would you say to this young man? His reply was gut-wrenching, telling he said, I would say you're welcome from the American taxpayer for the public education you received. He said, he needs to go back home, home, and get in line for citizenship behind other people from his country. This guy is a taker from the system, Kobach said. He hasn't, he hasn't paid enough in taxes to cover the benefits he's received from us, end quote. There's so much to be repulsed by there. But in those few sentences, it seems to me, is described the disease that is eating at the connective tissue of our society. While most of us are working hard, raising families, paying for our homes, paying our taxes as the dreamers do, some of our leaders are more than willing to evaluate us based on whether taxes paid in equal benefits received. To those who believe we should receive nothing without paying for it, Beauty, our theme this month, is a luxury that's not often afforded. And maybe in these times, beauty feels like a luxury for all of us. I would argue instead that beauty is essential. As John Muir wrote, everybody needs beauty as well as bread. Places to play in and pray in, where nurture and nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. Author John O'Donohue said it this way, the human soul is hungry for beauty. We seek it everywhere, in landscape, music, art, clothes, furniture, gardening, companionship, love, religion, and in ourselves. When we experience the beautiful, there's a sense of homecoming, for it meets the needs of our soul. In the experience of beauty, we awaken and surrender in the same act. He continues, these times are riven with anxiety and uncertainty. In the hearts of people, some natural ease has been broken. Our trust in the future has lost its innocence. At first, it sounds completely naive to suggest that now might be the time to invoke and awaken beauty. Because there's nowhere else to turn and we're desperate. Furthermore, it's because we have so disastrously neglected the beautiful that we now find ourselves in such terrible crisis. And Donahue concludes, much of the stress and emptiness that haunt us can be traced back to our lack of attention to beauty. Internally, the mind becomes coarse and dull if it remains unvisited by images and thoughts that hold the radiance of beauty. End quote. 
experience of beauty is a necessity for the human soul. Public beauty, including public sculptures, this one at the Apache light rail station, which sparked uh, conversations on a trip I had from that light rail station not long ago with strangers. Public sculptures and parks for just some examples of public beauty, paid for and sometimes created by all of us together. These are great equalizers. They situate beauty in the day-to-day lives of people, and they allow us all the access to the highest and best in humanity. When we're being told there's not enough to go around, we and the working and middle classes are pitted against one another. Sometimes being told that others are taking what's rightfully ours as a cure for that perceived separateness, even perceived competition. Public beauty draws us together to share common spaces. It lures us into knowing one another in all of our diversity in ways that we might not otherwise. To have conversations with our neighbors like I did that day on the way actually to the protest a couple weeks ago. It has been shown to lead people to become more involved in their communities. A few years ago, Gallup conducted a three-year study that they called Soul of the Community. They looked at 26 communities across the country to measure factors that foster people's attachment to their communities. They interviewed about 14,000 people a year and found that the aesthetics of a community, its public art, its green spaces, its parks, aesthetics and public beauty were top drivers of attachment to the town, much more than either education or safety, actually. We know that if we want people to stay put and contribute to their towns, pay taxes, we need to make room for the experience of public beauty. We know public beauty offers tremendous benefits, and yet we live in an era when American leaders are slashing all kinds of public programs. Can we even dream about recovering our shared life enough to take public beauty really seriously? I think there's an answer to that question, an affirmative one. Let me tell you something that happened to me this week that has me thinking we can fix this rampant selfishness, this race to the least we can do for one another that has taken root in our country. I was in a Valley Interfaith Project meeting with a bunch of my colleagues. It was a clergy meeting. VIP's lead organizer, I think he regretted this, but he gave us almost an hour at the beginning of the gathering just to process all the junk that was happening hurricanes and global warming and the destruction of DACA, and that was just last week. It's all so enormous. And we got to talking about how Americans of all stripes need to work together to solve these problems, but we sometimes don't know how to deal with folks who can't even agree on what the facts are. We all want to work with people who disagree with us on solutions to problems. That sounds like a good idea to everybody. But for heaven's sake, don't we have to agree on the facts, on the problem at some point? It felt so good to let all this out with my friends. But sheesh, I was feeling pretty depressed. And then my Methodist colleague Mary spoke up. She said, yeah, there are plenty of people who aren't interested in the facts. They aren't interested in working together, and they don't really want to question their worldview. They don't think the loss of our shared common lives as Americans is really a problem. Fine, Mary said. Let them be. Find the people with whom you can work and fix it with those people. Well, I should have thought of that before. (laughs) Her comment reminded me of this story from the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is instructing his disciples as he sends them out for ministry. He tells them to go around doing all sorts of good things for people. But as they travel around, they're not supposed to take any money with them. Instead, they're supposed to rely on the kindness of the residents of every town they enter. Yes, it's true. Jesus was a commie, hippie-taker-from-the-system type person. (laughs) At any rate... 
Jesus knew that some of the places his disciples went to wouldn't welcome their message. So he said, here's what you do. When you come into a house, you offer that house a blessing. And it's important to keep in mind that in Jesus' culture, a blessing had great power to do good. It meant something. Offer the house a blessing. But if you're rejected in that house, take back your blessing and leave. And not only that, but shake, shake the dust off your feet as you leave it and go to the next place. Don't take any of that rejection with you. Believe in the message of love and acceptance enough to shake off that rejection and find the people in the next town who are willing to work with you. I think we have to be careful here. We should listen to people who disagree with us. We should listen and learn from them. If we can't work with people who have a disagreement with us, then we're sunk. But it's okay to realize that this is not the place for me to invest lots of my time and try to change someone's mind. Well, that got me thinking about BUU. And here's a room full of people who have a vision for something better. There would be about 500 of us, you know, if we were ever to all be in one place at the same time, but we're like Clark Kent and Superman. (laughs) Our faith calls us to work for a world in which all people have access not just to food and water and a roof, but to beauty, the transcendent, access, some of us would say, to God. That which invites us out of the humdrum of daily existence to remember that which is greater than each of us, but within all of us. A necessity of the human experience. And here's a room full of people who care about that sort of thing. In fact, transcendent public beauty is what we're after in our worship services. Faith homes like this one have been a center of public beauty for a long time, musically and the visual arts and in other ways. And that meeting I was in with all those other clergy people, they're all interested in working on recovering our shared life too. What beauty there is in a table full of, okay, that meeting was mostly, mostly Methodists and me and a couple other people, but Muslims and rabbis, and other people working together. And many of the people they serve want to do the same thing. And what's more, there are public parks systems. There's a public arts department in Phoenix. There are free days at local art museums and art installations around the city of Phoenix. Places we can invest our time and energy, our resources of time and money, with people who care about everyone being able to experience beauty in their daily lives. I confess, I've sometimes been so worried about changing the minds of people who don't care about the things I care about, that I've forgotten about all those partners around me who are ready to work together to reconstruct the common good. Friends, I have shaken some dust off my feet this week. So in the midst of what can be a frightening and discouraging time, Let us not forget the vision of a robust common good that includes more than just keeping the most vulnerable alive. Let us remember just how many partners we have in working for that vision. I'm going to tell you a story. There were a lot of people when Medicaid was expanded here in uh, Arizona, who were working to pressure Governor Jan Brewer at the time to make that call. Uh, That coalition got together, and for a lot of reasons, uh, Jan Brewer signed into law Medicaid expansion in Arizona. Now, when the big vote came up in the Senate recently, are we going to sort of do away with Medicaid as a country or not. I mean, that sort of is what it would have boiled down to maybe. John McCain came back to cast the vote that kept us from going off that ledge. 
Would John McCain have cast that vote if all those people hadn't worked with Governor Jan Brewer, pressured her to sign the Medicaid expansion here? So did local organizing in Arizona prevent the United States from making a disastrous health care decision? It's a solid argument um, with maybe some imagination at the edges. (laughs) But it's true that local work matters. Local work makes a difference in other parts of the country in ways that we can't imagine when we're doing it. So I say let us work for a family and then a congregation and then a town and a state and maybe even a nation, who knows, in which all people have access not just to the bare necessities but to public beauty paid for by us, owned by us together. Amen.